The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Hello, my name's James Wrigley. I'm a financial advisor and one of the principals of Melbourne-based financial planning firm, First Financial. I've been a long-term listener and contributor to the Ensemble Group and podcast, picking up some amazing nuggets of gold over the years. And through this podcast and the people that I'm able to speak to and interview, hopefully I can continue to deliver some of those nuggets of gold to you. Your clients may want different things from retirement, but share a common need, income. Challenger's innovative lifetime income options are designed for today's retirees. With guaranteed regular income payable for life, regardless of how long your clients live, Challenger's lifetime income options help to manage longevity risks in a way many other investments can't. Help more clients do more, live more, create more. Contact your Challenger BDM or visit challenger.com.au forward slash portfolio dash outcomes. For a retirement portfolio that can deliver more, read and consider the Challenger Lifetime Annuity, Liquid Lifetime, PDS and TMD from challenger.com.au. Hello, welcome back to the podcast. We've got long-time listener, first-time caller, Laura Kelly on the, on the, on the podcast. Laura, thank you for, for joining me today. Thank you, James, for having me. And yes, long-time listener. I can tick this off now on one of my goals to do to be on a podcast. Was it was it was it one of your goals? You had it on a list. Someone one of one of the podcasts I did a few weeks ago that was actually one of their goals was to be on a podcast this year. Did you have that same thing? Yeah, no, hundred percent. I've got like a list of goals, dreams, and then miracles. And yeah, I spent time like probably a year ago going through and like personal, professional, writing down, okay, well, what are the goals, dreams, and miracles that I want to accomplish like over this lifetime? And yes, that actually was one, be on a podcast. <laughs> Could you talk any more about those goals, dreams, and miracles? Do you feel comfortable to share anything else? That's that's an interesting place to start. What yeah, else have you no, seen yourself? For sure. Um, I guess it all started like I'm into kind of manifesting and um, really – understanding to be present every day because I'm someone that kind of goes 100 miles an hour, I think, like a lot of us advisors. And I think, yeah, kind of being able to sit down and really reflect on, okay, goals are things that um, you do set timeframes and targets. Dreams are more, you know, a higher aspiration of a longer term goal, essentially, that you are working towards, um, that's a longer term kind of dream that you want to fulfill, not just like a ticker box. And then miracles are really, you know, the, I guess, ultimate, you know, final box you want to tick, but also it's, it's that full lifestyle that you've, you know, essentially for me, I'm, I'm like really aspiring to want to live every day. So, um, you know, I'm happy to kind of share, you know, some of my goals are to be a great advisor. Um, yeah. which is, a, I think that's a trust that is earned. Um, yes. And then naturally referrals will grow from that. So that's a, a goal that I think is probably a mix of a goal and a dream. Be on the FAAA chapter, Melbourne chapter committee. Wow. So, yeah, unfortunately I am on that. So that was, um, yeah, that was really good to be a part of um, that committee mm-hmm. and the, you know, networking regularly with um, like-minded individuals. Interesting goal I've got here is be on a news slash finance specialist TV. So, you know, that one probably might take a bit longer, but we'll uh, see how we go. You might have to move to Sydney, I reckon, like kick Ben Nash off the uh, the, the one that he does for Channel 7 or whoever it is, because they seem to be recorded, like a lot of that's done out of Sydney, isn't it? I think, anyway. I think, yeah, I do think, and there's another one. I I can't think of her name, but uh, Sugar Mama. I know oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So yes, Sydney again. So you know, maybe maybe that is the secret. Um, and then just high level dreams. It's make a difference to people's financial well being. Um, personally, travel when we want each year, and to have a family home with four bedrooms. So currently, we have a home with three bedrooms. Um, but kind of that dream is to have full bedroom home <laughs> for whatever reason. Is, is that just like a whole mash of work stuff and personal stuff just all together or do you separate it out or is or is it all just 
I'm interested in that you know, some people have this separation of work life and personal life, or is it your view that it's it's just all one life and some part of that time you spend working, some part of that time you spend not working? Uh, it's interesting. On paper, I kind of like when I brainstorm these and I spent quite a bit of time like writing down and thinking, what do I really want out of this life and what's my purpose? Um, and I ended up mashing the two together. But then like on a day-to-day like working and, and living balance, um, I'm very good at just naturally being able to switch off kind of yeah. when I get home. Like when I park the car in the garage and get out of the car, it's this, you know, I've just always been able to just switch completely off and kind of in life mode, um, yeah. which I think a lot of people struggle to do. Um, and I think it's something you might have to, like people have to work at, but for whatever reason, I guess, I've always, even like back in my tennis days when I was playing college tennis in America, like I was just always able to, when I was in the classroom, like focus. And then when I was at the tennis court, I would just, you know, label that study, you know, my mind was just set on tennis. So I don't know, I've always been able to kind of just separate and and be present. Mm. Do you find that, can you do the same thing if you're working at home? Like, is it? Is it the drive home or however you get home from work that, that has the separation or or like you're at home at the moment as we're recording this, can, can you just switch off this afternoon when you're finished work for the day and, and you're back in non-work mode? Yeah, no, that's a good question. I do find that like when I'm working from home, I still like get up and do the same routine like as I would go in the office, like do my makeup and hair um, just to feel like... I've got my face on for the day. <laughs> um, and then I do find I walk the dog every morning and, and when I get home. So I find I still walk him in the morning and then work. And then when I go out to walk him at night, it's like that mode of just switching yeah, again. That's mm. the split, isn't it? That's the end of the work day. Yep. Um, and look, you know, we are very important as financial advisors and our clients mean, you know, a lot to us. But I think at the same time, we're not, you know, no one's going to, I mean, really, no one's going to die if they don't get if we don't get back to them um, before yeah. the yeah today. Like, we're not we're not like surgeons, right? Um, we are important, but like I definitely feel you know there's the odd time where something will be urgent, urgent, and you need to do it at you know after hours. But I feel like apart from that, you know, it can most things can probably wait till the next morning. Yeah, and so that that kind of goals and dreams kind of list that you've that you've just explained for yourself. Have you been through that exercise with any clients? Interesting. Um, it's something that's kind of like building in the pipeline. I'm kind of trying to create, you know, you don't want to over engineer anything and and I I'm always overthinking everything I do, like I said, going a hundred miles an hour. Um so it's something I'm wanting I definitely touch on the goals. Um yeah. And the dreams, but probably not the miracles part, which is interesting. Um, and that might just be my own internal biased opinion because I'm still quite young compared to a lot of my clients where I think miracles needs to be more like that. You, you create it when you're young. But I think that's a mindset as I am getting older. I'm starting to be like, well, you know, anyone can change their ideal miracle world at any time. I don't think it has to be done when you're necessarily young. Yeah, true. And then it's also you've got the challenge of you know, you've you've got your own style and you know, some of these things that you're doing yourself would be fantastic to bring into your work environment. But then you work in a business that already has kind of processes and procedures and so forth and you need to do this and you need to do this and you need to do this to spit out a statement of advice at the end and, and take your clients on a particular journey where you have a process for it. It'd be difficult, I would imagine, I've, I've faced it in, in, in the past to try and bring in some of these things that you want to do but fit it into a kind of bigger, well-established business that already has its own processes. That's going to be a challenge to do as well. Yeah, no, I agree with that 100%. And I think, you know, because we are so process-driven with compliance, with statement of advice, I think what I try and always do is be relatable to my clients and, you know, yes, give them a compliance statement of advice, but I always will spend time to kind of, take the key pages out of the document and a lot of the graphs and visual aspects because most people are visual yeah, um, sure. learners and kind of put it together in like a 10-page PowerPoint presentation, which, look, it does take extra time, but um, we're definitely seeing 
a lot more value, like the clients are really valuing kind of getting that simple version um, mm. and, and just the key highlights. And then um, kind of, you know, I always say, you know, when you can't sleep at night, just here's the document to read as well. Like, um, <laughs> Yeah. To so what are you, who, are the, who are the clients you're working with at the moment? So you said they're yeah. generally older than you. Who, who are they? What do they look like? So I guess um, my background story, I did start a secure investor self-licensed firm back in or the back end of 2022 or middle back end. Um, and essentially I, I was fortunate I got to take over uh, an existing book of clients um, from a departing advisor. Um, so essentially my clients are mainly in the 50s category. So a lot of mine are in the 50s, early to mid, and then into early 60s as well. So really, a lot of them are still working. It's a lot of my bread and butter strategies and day-to-day conversations are like planning to retire in the next three, five, or 10 years, yep. um, which I find is really like the area that is exciting in life because I think that's when we really can make such a difference to then someone's retirement. Well, they're approaching such a they're, they're approaching such a, a big period of change. Like a, a conversation I had with a client earlier in the in the week, it was like, well, at the moment when you're working, you're near that fifty year old. You keep showing up for work, and you know you're going to keep getting paid. It's pretty simple. Show up on Monday, you're going to get paid. Show up on Monday, you're going to get paid. But then all of a sudden, there's this fear that we're helping clients transition through to say you can give away needing to show up on Monday morning. You've done enough, paid off your mortgage, got enough in super, whatever it is to be able to retire. So it's, I can understand it's an interesting type of client to be working with because there's such a transition on the horizon for them. Yeah, no, it is. And and it's really, I think part of when I go back to like that manifesting journey that, you know, I started a few years ago, which has really transformed my life. I really try with all my clients to, you know, also let them enjoy the now. Like, yes, we're planning for your retirement. you got to sacrifice maybe contributing a little bit more to super now for those tax deductions while you're still paying tax and and all these things. But I really challenge my clients to like, you know, we want to live now because you also don't want to miss out on going out to dinners or potentially going on still a couple of nice holidays while you're working um, all to just have, you know, millions in retirement, but then potentially your body's broken down or, you know, you just don't know what health uh, or what's really around the corner in general. So I think- You know, what we do as financial planners is we always forward think, which is great, and that's what we need to do to help our clients. But I definitely find maybe it's, you know, controversial, but maybe from my experience, the typical older school advisor was really focused on the returns and focused on building up that wealth for your retirement. Rather, I feel like a missing link potentially was also, well, what about the now as well? Like to mm. make sure you're living your best life now, not just let's just like sacrifice and get you the most for when you are retired, essentially. Yeah. How do you how do you like manage that? And so what what I'm like I'm trying to say is like, do you have any tools? Like do you have any do you use any modeling software? Like how do you how do you how do you encourage that to say, you know, essentially say to a client you can afford to spend a bit more now and continue to enjoy yourself now, tomorrow is going to be okay if we do one, two, three, or four. But how do you how do you show them that? How do you give them that confidence? Well, um, I use X Tools okay. Plus. Um, so, you know, Calm, and, and I use a lot of those projections and it's really useful to show like, okay, well, this is, you know, here's a plan and this is what we're looking at in 5, 10, 15 years um, if we keep doing what we're doing or – if we end up potentially taking out five thousand or ten thousand over the next few years, like ad hocly at certain periods, this is the effect it's going to have. And a lot of the time, it actually gives them reassurance and confidence to be like, "Oh, like I'm. It's not really draining the overall final position by a lot." Um, yep. And I think that's that's where it comes back down to. I reckon for a lot of my clients, anyway, the the visual aspect um, and to be able when they're in the room or even after, but when they're there to live, be able to show them like different projections or different scenarios um, to then give them confidence. Obviously nothing's guaranteed, right? Um, Mm. All our projections are based on, 
usually a conservative return and, and things like that. And there's factors like if someone gets made redundant, like all those things don't get factored in. But, you know, we try and do what we can as as you would probably do this similar approach to map out the best we can um, for their future scenario based on now. Yeah, and if you keep if you keep if you keep doing that exercise with them over time, it's well you're doing it today. Tomorrow something happens. Okay, the next time you do that modeling, it's going to take into account whatever you know about them then in their situation. You can you can keep adjusting it over time. Where do you so you, you said you took over a, a book of clients? Have you had to try and grow that at all? Do you, are you just looking after those that are there? Can you can you talk about some of that? Yeah, for sure. So I took over a book of 140 clients. Wow, it's a lot. Yeah, it is a lot. Um, so essentially, yes, like I still am always like, uh, that's my problem is I don't know when to t- kind of stop taking on new clients um, because I just want to help people. Um, but definitely I, I'm not necessarily expected to, you know, bring on like, you know, 30 new clients a year. Um, But it's very interesting because in the time I've, you know, nearly two years I've been with working with these particular clients and naturally where I was previously, I had a, you know, clients I built up from zero and obviously some of them might have found me. (laughs) Um, But essentially I think it's really interesting. I think the more I'm just – you know, honest and relatable and, you know, I'm expecting them to tell, you know, their, to tell me all about their financial position in their life, I equally open up um, to them. Yeah. Uh, and I feel like instantly that for pretty much 95% of the clients I've taken on, it's just like built this instant kind of, you know, f- the trust and they just feel you know, I'm so open and honest with them. Like I'm getting married in a week in a bit. And, you know, I just sent a big email out to all my clients just to let them know like July, I'm going to be away pretty much all the month. Um, And I got back 125 emails within 30 hours. Only one person was a bit like, oh, like congrats, but like, oh no, like, you know. What am I going to do without you? Yeah. (laughs) But, you know, everyone else, it was lovely, you know, like, and again, I just feel like that, is a testament to it's time, obviously, more time you will get, develop more and more with your clients, as I'm sure a lot of advisors that listen have had long, long-term relationships. And, you know, I guess in this situation, yes, it's been a shorter relationship thus far, but I feel like because I'm just a very honest person in general and, you know, quite a direct person and, and just open up just as they do to me, I just feel like that's actually worked in my favour with mm. my clients. Yeah. And so do you, do you then find you get referrals from your clients because you've built so, what it seems like a pretty strong relationship with them in a, a relatively short period of time? It, it, so new client work tends to come from existing clients. Yeah, no, it's very yeah, it's very interesting. That that tends to be what's happening. My biggest referral source is my clients and I haven't even really started to – you know, ask yet for referrals from them or kind of, you know, be like, you know, is there anyone else that we could consider helping? I haven't, you know, felt comfortable just yet to even ask for that because it's still a short period. But I have had over 15, you know, within the last nine months just, of, you know, calling through the, com- you know, the office number or, and actually saying, you know, Laura was referred to us um, yeah. or, you know, which which is great. But I guess we also have a team where, you know, if I am full or if I'm very busy in certain months, then there is others that can help. But I guess when it is more a client referral, you kind of do want to be the one to contact them because it, it really was um, a personal, you know, referral that, that they've experienced and they're, if they're telling their family or friends, you, you know, don't want to just kind of pass that on to another advisor just in case the client might, you know, might not look that good to them. Yeah. And but I, I would imagine that if you, if you took over 140 and then you've had a few new clients kind of find you over the, over the journey, you've got to be pretty full as it is. Like, do, is there... Has has you have others in the business been through an exercise of like trying to transition clients to a different advisor? Is, is that 
happened at all? Yeah, no, look, it definitely sounds, and it, look, it is a lot for sure. Um, I do have my own, you know, full-time ASO, yep. so support. So he, you know, does a lot of the prep work um, and implementation work and, and books in all the meetings and does a lot of that. So he really, you know, I, I wouldn't be able to be doing, we, we wouldn't be able to manage our clients. Uh, we're a team. Um, and then I'm also fortunate that we have a professional year guy as well who is sitting with myself and three other advisors. So, you know, he's learning a lot and, and starting to really build his craft and, and strategy knowledge. Um, but then it kind of benefits us advisors as well because he kind of gets to you know, the meetings he joins, it's, there's no kind of, obviously I read the file notes and everything, but that kind of element and time gets taken off my desk. Yeah. Um, nice, yeah, yeah. 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 So I guess, look, for sure, like there's, there's a point in, you know, June, we're in June. So meetings are booked for um, catch ups. So, you know, there's going to be, yes, definitely a point of understanding at what point am I considered capped? Yeah. Um, because uh, and then I have to reassess, you know, with with the business. Okay, well, what's the plan? Because you know, part of what I love is just is is that that new connection and that initial, you know, complex scenario and just meeting people and then helping really in the first year, two, three years, really is where you transform a lot of even their education around for sure. um, finance. So yeah, that's going to be an ongoing conversation to to have because. You also want to make sure you're giving 100% to every meeting you're in. Yep. Yeah. And prior to, sec- prior to Secure Invest, you were at NAB prior to that? Yes, I was at NAB. So, yeah, so I started there in 2018. Um, was the best experience. I remember before then I did some homework and connected with a bunch of, you know, advisors, just LinkedIn, just went and followed a bunch of people and messaged them and said, you know, what's your experience um, for someone who is, you know, done admin work in the industry and now wanting to be an advisor associate, should I go to a small firm? Should I go to a big firm? You know, and I was getting, it's interesting, I got a lot of mixed messages from different people. Most were probably saying go to a boutique firm. So naturally I did the opposite, right? <laughs> and um, yeah, went to a bank. Um, personally, for me, I had the best experience. Um, I felt like it was a really amazing place to learn my fundamentals. I had access to, you know, I was an associate advisor for the first 12 months. So I had access to about 12 advisors that I could just choose to go and sit in with. Yeah. Um, so I got to add a lot of different, you know, techniques to my toolbox to then kind of make my own Everyone talks for everyone talks fondly of their of their bank experience. Like a, the, you know, there's been a number of people I've had on the podcast that are now working wherever they're working, but have worked for Commonwealth or or you know Westpac or in in your case NAB. And everyone talks really really fondly. Like all of the beat up that was in the press, the advisors that were working in there really loved it for all for different reasons. But they, everyone speaks really really highly of their of their time there. It seems like. Was, was did did NAB have? And I haven't kept track of this too much myself. You may have some insight. Did NAB have financial advice like in, internally for longer than the other banks? Like if it was, if that was only how long ago was that that you left the bank to two and a bit years ago, three years ago? It's not doesn't seem that long ago. Well, uh, when I was at NAB, we during the time at NAB, towards the end of my time at NAB, and this was probably a big reason that you know, kind of translated to looking at new opportunities was we were then sold off with MLC division. Oh, yeah, right. Yeah. So then we became, yeah, we got sold off with all that. And then, um, you know, it's like, I guess that was my first big merger um, yeah. and restructure, um, which, you know, like there's pros and cons to, to it all. Um, but I still keep in touch to this day to my original hiring manager, um, who, you know, I've now had three bosses over my journey and they all had their pros and cons, but he's probably definitely the one that had a really big impact to to my career so far. Yeah, fantastic. Now, I want to have a bit of a chat about something you mentioned earlier about playing college tennis in the in the US. Like what's, 
what what were you doing? Obviously, going to university, but what like what made you get over there, and what what did you study? What was what was happening? Mm-hmm. So, fun fact: I'm the only child, and I moved to America, Florida, a week after I turned sixteen. So, all by, by myself. Yourself. Like my yeah, my parents moved me over. Um, I was in a uh, like an academy. It's oh, for tennis. An, yeah, Nick Voluntary Academy. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah, so only child, don't know how my parents let me do it, but um, I was offered a scholarship, well, like a half scholarship to the academy at 16. So first I finished um, my year 12 over there, equivalent, um, yes. senior year of high school. Um, so, yeah, I was training for three and a half, four hours a day, um, Monday to Friday, Plus, then you'd go to school for four hours um, a day. Mm. And, yeah, then essentially I was grateful, lucky enough to um, get a scholarship, a full scholarship to a school in Georgia in America. Um, And, look, it's really intense. And I think that actually probably is how I've been able to be so disciplined, even though, you know, starting as an advisor younger than probably today's world of professional year. Um, and then kind of really building the bricks a bit. Um, I think my discipline of having tennis for three, four hours a day and then school um, and then a little bit of party time and social life because you have to. Um, I really think the discipline of that has helped me to be a really structured person today. Yeah. Which, which, to be honest, if we go back to manifesting, that's also kind of a negative at times because I often forget to be present and I'm very hard on myself. Yeah, yeah, that's from those tennis days. What, what did you study over there? What you uh, so, I, yeah, I did a business degree in economics mm-hmm. and then um, in my, I did three years over there at college and then when I was 21, uh, like a week after I turned 21, I moved back home to Australia um, and I actually finished my last year of my degree uh, at RMIT. So that's where I chose financial planning when I came back. And okay. all my subjects basically translated to the equivalent of, you know, in Australia for financial planning degree. Um, so, yeah, then I just did the last year here and, and got a, a job, you know, in uh, ASO while I was at uni. And then, yeah, and then it now took over. Yeah, fair enough. That's uh, that's the dream for a young tennis player to uh, to go over to an academy and, and go to college over there. Do you still play now? Uh, yeah, I do, actually. I only got back into it two years ago, um, so yeah. I had a, a break for a while. But, um, yeah, I actually just had – we our team made finals on Monday night and we lost. But, <laughs> um, well, <laughs> it was a draw. Man. We played the team and it was a draw. So they're like, well, it's finals, so it can't be a draw. Like you have – so we had to play another set. Yeah. And then we, yeah, choked. So that's um, no <laughs> that's no good. We won our finals uh, a couple of weeks ago. A couple of weeks ago by uh by a whole one game. So you you play tennis too? Yeah, me and my double, me and my partner. We were up by six. We lost. We lost our set six love. Uh, then my other team members won their set by. They won at six five. We ended up winning the grand final by one one point. And they had the, whole, the other team had this whole bench of like supporters. There's like twenty people cheering them on, and we had one person from our team there. So, so <laughs> it was good to win. Is it serious? Like, is it is it a high level or is it more social? Oh, like it's a, like a social Thursday night thing. It, oh, like, yeah. I, we all think we're good tennis players. I'm sure you're a far better tennis player than what we all are. But uh, it's a yeah, it's a good bit of fun. So we two from here. Is- yeah, we're two from here for you. Where, um, where, where are you headed in financial advice? What's on your uh, on your manifestation? I'm reflecting it at the moment and, and spending time getting to network with a couple of um, advisors and even some kind of executive managers at some large businesses as mentors at the moment um, just to kind of do a bit of a review and kind of figure out um, what the next – three, five years might look like for myself. Um, for now, it's, you know, keep just being myself and relatable to my clients and keep up with um, all the new trends and strategies and changes to legislation um, that happens. But um, 
Yeah, I think for me, it's again, I'm my worst critic. So I almost think I'm not doing enough, yeah. um, which is bizarre because I know I'm, I'm, I'm doing great, but in my own head, I feel like there's something missing. Um, I think a lot of it, financial literacy is probably a passion piece of mine that um, I'm starting to really dive into a bit more and, and that's really, really filling my cup a lot. Fantastic. Um, and then I guess if I kind of touch on the miracles that um, were on my sheet and that's more, you know, something that over your lifetime or a, a real long, long-term approach, um, you know, Equity in a firm is is really up there. Um, you know, it's a miracle, something you really it, you want to keep striving to achieve. You may not achieve it ever, but it's something that is really that longer term plan. Um, Mary Stefan, who is my fiance, and I am achieving that miracle soon. So that'll be exciting. And then, um, you know, there's a few others on there, but I think family health and you know doesn't always have to be just professional related um yeah. kind of when you're looking at your own life i think success means a lot of different things to different people and i think as i'm getting a bit older i'm starting to um review my own version of what success means yep yep and that'll change over time too as you get married and move to a bigger house and some of these other things it's like oh well you know i thought i wanted this thing but maybe i don't want that thing anymore uh, and it'll, it'll change over time. Just as it changes for your clients, it's going to change for you too. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's all part of the journey. Even You know, we go through the journey with our clients and I'm sure a lot of listeners have been advisors and or been in the industry for a long time. And, you know, I'm, um, I'm always someone who's open and always happy to hear someone's story and journey. And I think that's why I love advice because we get to understand a person and hear all right, well, what brought you to this, you know, what brought you here to this point today? Where do you see yourself getting to and, and helping them bridge that gap um, and enjoying the journey of it? And I think that's why I actually love even just networking with people like yourself, even though we met recently, kind of fangirling a little bit um, Thursday night when we had our event. <laughs> but really networking with people in strand, hearing their story and their career and in their life in general and I don't know I just I just love understanding people's story for some reason yeah well Laura maybe we'll we'll leave it there thank you for joining me this morning for this good to chat and uh, uh, as you said at the start a younger female in financial advice to provide your perspective which is which is fantastic to share thank you for joining me and uh, we'll catch up again soon thanks James 